nearly there. Great. I think we might be, we might almost be live. There's always a slight delay. So we'll just give it a fraction of a second uh, and I'll get the nod from my team. It looks, you just give me a yell, Emily, when you know where, yeah. absolutely. There'll be a few people starting to tune in and they might be hearing this. So if you're an early bird, it's great to have you join us. Uh, and we will kick off this conversation with Brendan O'Connor, the Shadow Small Business Minister. And I've got the thumbs up, Brendan, to say that we oh, are live. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so welcome. Thank you for joining us. And, and people from across the Blue Mountains and the Hawkesbury, um, mm. a lot of whom you've, you've been here in not that many months ago and you've spoken to a lot of small businesses, but we've probably got a wider reach yeah. than the tourism and hospitality people that we caught up with a few months ago when you were here. So there's lots mm. of people keen to um, share thoughts and get your ideas on things. For those who don't know Brendan, Brendan's the Shadow Minister for Small Business and I'm sure Industry is in there. Yeah. Uh, and um, a very, ex one of my, our really experienced uh, Shadow Ministry members, and, and I have to say someone who really understands and has understood the issues I've raised about small business. So I'm really thrilled you could join me tonight, Brendan. Happy to and, be here too. And I think we're pretty fortunate that this is virtual, given that you're in Melbourne and we know that mm. you Melbournians are back in lockdown. And I think every yeah. business in the Hawkesbury and Blue Mountains would just feel their, their um, you know, teeth clenched at the idea yeah. of having to go back. So yeah. tell me, how, how does it feel for your community second time round? Yeah. Look, thanks, Susan. Firstly, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for everyone participating this evening in what is a really important event, both locally and for me, in terms of developing policy for the opposition, it's also it informs national, potentially national policy. So it really is a great opportunity for me and I hope it is for others. Um, look, it's difficult. Uh, it's difficult to when you think you've gone past something that you've, we've done well collectively as a community, uh, Melbourne, you know, has, uh, you know, one in five Australians. It's a big, big city. And uh, to have it locked down in the way it is, um, is a bit of a blow for businesses, small businesses in particular, having been forced to close or be restricted for legitimate health reasons the first time, and then have the opening up of those restrictions and a sort of sense of hope uh, an opportunity to recover, to have this return, revisit us, uh, has been difficult. But small business people, I mean, remarkably resilient, often very sometimes stoic, um, but um, difficult, no doubt. And um, what we need to do, I think, as a, as a country and, and in terms of an opposition in forming government, I'm hoping provide uh, for the government raise questions when they that we don't think they're attending to matters often informed by small businesses everywhere else as you know Susan we listen to people and have that inform our views and I think we've been doing that to date we work constructively um, but certainly act as an opposition and raise questions if we're concerned about things not being done there are a lot of questions that are coming up uh, small businesses in my electorate in Melbourne are asking questions about what will happen after September mm -hmm. with, the, with the change with the, at the moment with the end of JobKeeper. Now the government has made some broad assurances that there'll be something else, uh, as you know, and I think we should talk about that today because yeah. we certainly will want to help the government and if you like, push the government to support businesses if we think they're not forthcoming, sufficiently supportive. Um, I'm hoping we won't have to do that. I'm hoping they fully understand how hard it is. And for community, you've been hit by the bushfires 
are now uh, by this global pandemic. So you really have uh, had terribly difficult times. And uh, I'm really you know, looking forward to this conversation to see whether we can work through some issues and maybe come up with some ideas that might be work, not just at the federal level, but even work at the state level and local government level as well. Yeah, so, and what we'll do, for those who haven't been part of this, it's really a virtual Q&A, and I get to ask your questions of Brendan or raise your points. So there's a couple of ways you can do that. Some people have emailed us through questions already during the day, and we'll start with those. But if you'd like to ask a specific question or make a comment, just put it in the comments on Facebook, and my guys are watching those comments, and they'll get your message through to me so that I can uh, throw in to add to the conversation or, or steer it in a different direction. Um, so just pop your comment into the comments under this feed on Facebook and we'll be keeping an eye open for those. And, and yeah, Brendan, we'll absolutely need to spend some time talking about JobKeeper. Uh, yeah. And I guess there'll be, I know already that because there's lots of tourism and hospitality, I, I certainly want to chat with you about what that might look like after September. Um, yep. The bushfires is another piece of it. So I think we're, we're going to kind of work through all those issues. Yep. Uh, it's interesting you talk about businesses being stoic. Some would tell me that they're stubborn. And, you know, that's <laughs> as someone who's spent 25 years in small business and yep. grew up my parents' small business. Um, yep. They're the qualities you need often to, to get through what has been an extraordinary, extraordinarily difficult Absolutely. time. But you know, yeah. the thing that I've noticed, it isn't the same for every business. Some businesses no. are telling me they're really booming. So it's a yeah. very uneven thing. Uh, is that the feedback you're getting across the country, a very patchy? Uh, very much so, very much so. So you have, as you know, firstly, if you just take a, a strip of shops in, 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 your, in your local suburb, um, or local community, uh, I'll talk to the fruit and veg guy who's who's doing really well. <laughs> and of course you talk to service industry, hairdressers, um, beauticians and so on. Of course, they're being shut and they're open and they're shut uh, and they're doing it so difficult. So you see the extremes where there are people actually doing as well as they were before the pandemic or in some cases better. Um, and they feel a bit guilty. I mean, I've got this lovely uh, fruit and veg guy, Pat, you know, he. He feels guilty that he's doing okay. And I said to him, it's not his fault. And he's, he's providing essential service, providing us with uh, what he does, his goods. But um, yeah, it must feel a bit funny. You know, you're in the same, the same community of shops and some are losing and some are really struggling and closing and others are, uh, are thriving. And that's the same with industries too. Um, some of the industries, starting with most obvious with aviation uh, and then hospitality, accommodation, tourism have been hit so hard um, and they and and of course, um, therefore, the support from government has to be targeted in areas uh, that have been hurt most most uh, of all. That's really critical. And I've got some. We've had some concerns about the way in which the JobKeeper has made ineligible businesses because they employ casuals, and it has been in sectors most affected, which have had a higher proportion of casuals. Therefore, they've had less support. Than they should have, which is a, a design fault, I think, of JobKeeper. I mean, I think the JobKeeper overall has been great, but I think there's been real, there's been unfortunate areas where people have been ineligible. And if workers are ineligible, that means most importantly, their businesses are ineligible for that support. And I think that's what we'll keep saying to government you've got to support the areas most affected, you have to, you have to provide them the most support. What we know in the electorate of Macquarie is we've got two of the postcodes that are in the top 10% of uh, suburbs relying on JobKeeper, the, the postcodes yeah. in the Hawkesbury of 2756 and 2758. Right. Yeah. And that's partly because there's lots of self-employed people in those areas, uh, but also people whose industries and businesses were very severely hit, like the construction mm. sector. Uh, and so I, I think there's real concern about um, how there's certainly no sense that there's going to be a snapback. No one here is talking about a snapback. 
uh, it's a slow crawl out of it, but no one can quite see how that happens. So there is a lot of worry about September. So in terms of there's we're expecting to find out next week, aren't we, what the yeah. government's plan is. I mean, I, I wish they'd told us sooner because businesses are trying to plan ahead. Uh, are we getting any clues yeah. as to what they're thinking? Well, I mean, firstly, we have called on the government at least to provide broad assurance as much as they possibly can. No one doubts and no one envies the difficulty of, of public servants and the government trying to calibrate this, this next response. I mean, it's easy for us to attack the government. We have to hold them to account. But equally, I do understand the complexity because, for example, if you're planning something two weeks ago, you wouldn't have factored in that Melbourne was bringing back restrictions. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a universal policy which will, att which will attend, to, you know, which will provide greater support if areas have been uh, returned to restriction. That seems to be important or where people are still struggling. It seems to me where the support must go is where people are still struggling. And as you say, your communities have high proportion of, well, you've got independent contractors, partnerships, sole traders, you have small businesses in accommodation, food and accommodation, um, tourism, et cetera. All of these areas have been really hit. Um, I think tourism can recover. I'm not saying right now that's, and I'll be really interested to see whether that's taking shape at all because even though we're losing inbound uh, we've got certainly the case in Victoria before the movement uh, was restricted you know Victorians weren't going anywhere other than other parts of Victoria and certainly even with the internal borders opening up when they are fully opened up Australians will be traveling with inside Australia you know you'll get a lot more people I think to the Blue Mountains from other parts of Australia because they won't be going overseas and the same with other tourist precincts of the nation. Um, but, but certainly, um, in terms of what we expect from the government, uh, they've made some assurances that they will be focusing on the most affected. They've said that there'll be some sort of re recasting of JobKeeper, but they haven't given us uh, sufficient information for us to know. And I think they're still trying to work it out, frankly. And the quicker they do that, the better, because it's really dry making it so hard for businesses to make a commercial decision as yeah. to whether they can continue on or whether they can keep their workforce on because there are a whole range of other costs that they have to pay for even if they get support. Mm -hmm. And people need to know that information, not at the end of September, not at the end of August even, but as soon as possible. So hopefully next week, uh, the treasurer in his financial statement, in his statement to the, to the country, will be outlining what forms of support that businesses in your electorate and electorates around the country are in receipt of. And I'm hoping they'll, in doing that, not only maintain some support, but fix up some of the design faults that they've had in the past. Yeah. For example, not allowing you to employ a person on JobKeeper if they replace another person who's left. Right now, and I know that's a question that's gonna to come to me, I did see that, but right now I know that if someone were to leave, uh, you, even if you replace them, you can't you can't subsidise that wage because they're not they're, they weren't employed at Master First with your business, and they're the sort of things maybe the government has to be looking at. Yeah, that is one that assert, there's cafes across the electorate, and one in particular who who I've been discussing this with. You know, you can't bind your employee to you if they're choosing and if their circumstances change and they need to leave. Uh, but for a small business, losing one person on JobKeeper uh, and having to employ someone at, a f at full cost to replace them is hard, particularly as the, um, you know, you're still having to pay leave entitlements and super and those yep. sorts of things accrue those things. And, and of course, small businesses have said to me, look, this is fine to subsidise the wages, but I've got all the other costs and the turnover yep. that I'm getting is not necessarily covering those. So they're, uh, the way I see it, there's lots of treading water at the moment. People mm. are you know, just above, just above the water level. And the things that happen from here on will really determine how many businesses we see close. We've certainly seen a number close in the wake of the bushfires. Uh, and now, well, I think one thing we're gonna to have to look for next week with any announcement that's made, uh, people are very wary when governments say, if your turnover is 30% down or 50% down or 70% down, 
Um, that's been proven to be a for some a very straightforward measure, but for other others a difficult measure to meet in bushfire assistance, for instance. Uh, yeah. So, you know, especially if that business had expanded in the previous 12 yeah. months. So it's not like for like. Their turnovers no. more, but their costs are also more because they might have opened another outlet. Uh, so they're the sorts yeah. of things I know we'll be looking at closely. And I think it's fair to say that, look, I mean, the government has done better with respect to pandemic than it's done with the bushfires. It was very woefully slow and, and not responsive. And in fact, the forms of support that have arisen out of the responding to the pandemic should have been the forms of support that would have arisen out of those areas uh, in New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia that are affected just so devastatingly by bushfires, namely sort of forms of subsidy, not just loans and very difficult grants. Now, uh, but we can't go back in that. I just think the government may have learned that that was not sufficient. But yeah, yeah. Look, but what... some of their policies oh, I... destruction. Yeah, come on. Sorry. No, no. We just we just lost you. We just dropped you out there. Finish that so, thought. Right. <laughs> no, I was just saying that some of the policies are not working. Like the home renovation policy, that's supposed to help tradies and the construction industry there's been no applications yet. So again, the design of the, that excludes too many people. Um, and I think the government, when, when look, these things happen. And when a, when a government puts up a stimulus package that is not attractive to any applicant or to very few people, then they have to rewrite it so that it's going to help them. Uh, because at the moment, that home renovation, that sort of home builder policy has been um, not taken up at all. And I, I just make that as an example that governments need to just accept that it was a mistake, accept it's not working and fix it. Don't mess around when you're in the middle of a, not just a global pandemic, but we're going through the worst economic struggles we've had since arguably the Great Depression. I don't want to upset people, but that's where we could end up if we don't get ourselves uh, working properly and having government stimulate the economy uh, over you know, in an ongoing way. Um, just on home builder, I remember speaking to local builders when that policy was announced, just to say to them, hey, how does this feel? And I think underwhelmed is probably the response they had. Uh, yeah. And I wonder, I have seen some reports that there's, it's got much more of a prospect in places like Western Australia and with project homes, but we live in an area where home construction is quite restricted on the Blue Mountains. Yes, side. yes, of course, yeah. Different, yeah, you're not rolling out hundreds of, of project homes. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've not yet heard of anybody, any new job coming to a builder. It, it may have in the last couple of weeks. It, they, they hoped it would maybe um, nudge people who were already, they were already planning to do it and, you know, but that was probably still the same time frame. So, yeah, we're not expecting a big economic boost from that program. And one builder I spoke to said actually all his work has dried up. He didn't want to apply for JobKeeper oh, yeah. because he had pre-approval on a loan to work for, for another property that he would then use as a, as a project. Um, are, are you hearing this, that people, small businesses, are reluctant to um, risk being seen to be dependent on, on JobKeeper because they're worried about the impact it will have on their financial, other financial situations? Uh, I have heard that some haven't taken it up, but overwhelmingly, I mean, it is, it has been, a, there has been an enormous take up, if you think about it, in terms of the scale of it, covering over, three, I mean, just the amount of employees, it's in excess of 3 million employees, and it's, therefore it's hundreds of thousands of businesses that are applicants uh, and in receipt of um, this subsidy. And I think, it's despite all of its faults, it's still a it's still the probably the most important element of support because it really labour costs are so much uh, the you know so, such a, a burden on on businesses. If you can alleviate that in a significant way, uh, then that's that's good. I just think that they should have they should have of course included casuals in sectors that are, will be that will be forced to shut down. These are not businesses who are in the marketplace who are struggling. This is a marketplace that's been closed down for health reasons, legitimately, 
and therefore they should have been provided support, particularly where over half their workforce or more are casuals. They should have been given, there should have been more support in my view. And I think that's one of the unfortunate parts of it. But um, there are some businesses that are fearful. I mean, we did, just as we did with the bushfires, we have also asked again for the government to provide um, financial assistance for small businesses to access experts, accountants in particular, to navigate the, the, you know, so that they can get a voucher and they can get proper advice peculiar to their business to deal with some of these uh, options. Uh, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that hasn't, the government hasn't embraced that option. They may do down the track. I don't know. They haven't to date. I have had some accountants tell me they've never been busier. <laughs> well, that'd be right. That'd be absolutely right because people are you know, confounded by what they're right. this is unprecedented and they have to go to them anyway, but it would have been made, it would have alleviated some of the pressure and there'll be some businesses that will be making decisions without, in my view, sufficient advice. And that, that worries me too. That, worries, that should worry us all. Yeah. Now, look, this one's a, a, an interesting one that's come up in my conversations with small business and, and a, a local hotel operator is, is raising it again, has, as have other people. And mm. that is around um, the amount of money that people are, are being paid on job seeker. And we're just starting anecdotally. I know the data doesn't suggest this because there's still 12 people for every job that's available. Um, but mm. anecdotally, there is um, a concern that the level of job seeker means there's not enough incentive for people to find employment. Now, I think that's a really temporary situation, but it's certainly something that people are just starting to notice. How, how do you think about... Um, you know, clearly the old level of job seeker is completely untenable yeah, yeah. for someone to survive and look for work. Uh, look, Susan, uh, I, yeah. Hmm. I, I'm, to, well, I, I was, I, frankly, I thought the, the government made a number of errors, in my view, and it's in hindsight, but we look, when, when they convened the parliament, they, their stimulus two package had no wage subsidy in it. No. In fact, it had some form of withholding tax, which was useful. It was not a lot, but it would provide an opportunity for businesses to keep the withholding tax, and that would be some benefit without a doubt, and they could use it in a very broad way. That was useful. Um, they then, then they doubled New Start, and they had no wage subsidy package, and they closed the parliament down, they said, for six months and left. Two weeks later, we were back. Uh, um, enacting a JobKeeper package, yeah. I was surprised that when they eventually came back, realising the unemployment queues at every Centrelink office, uh, when they saw them, um, when they returned, I was surprised they didn't recast the job seeker. Mm -hmm. And yes, of course, uh, the new start allowance is woefully low, but it did surprise me that they doubled it. Um, and when there was such a small gap between the wage subsidy uh, and this new social payment. And frankly, look, you know, we're not in government, but I, I think we would have focused straight away on a wage subsidy and business support. Uh, cash payments would have been out there just to keep the economy going, which is what they also did. So I give them, I mean, like, and, uh, and, and I think, there would have been other forms of support, industry support, but I don't think, you know, look, who knows now, but I think the, I was shocked that they doubled job seeker, doubled new start, yeah. um, because I think um, we, the most important thing was to keep businesses going and workers connected to the labour market. Instead, by doubling the unemployment benefit, you attract, you almost accelerated people being attracted to leaving the labour market at a time when you need them connected. So, again, that's another, my view, a design fault in my view i think it would have been better that they focus on the job keeper that they made those are ineligible made them eligible and then they would have had yes less money on the job seeker almost all employees so that would have been the way we should have done it and i think they shouldn't be too proud to revise that and whatever they do in the future i think they'll bring, they'll draw down they'll reduce the levels of job seeker they should broaden the eligibility of JobKeeper, in my view. That's what they need to do to keep the businesses going because businesses get nothing from JobSeeker, uh, but workers and businesses get something from JobKeeper. 
Um, and it's no point just putting all the money into the welfare area. You should probably put the money into the labour market. Businesses and workers both benefit. Now, one, uh, someone has just commented, Gay's just commented that her grandson has been on Job Seeker and has found a job, but he's actually, he's informed Centrelink and she says that he's been told to stay on Job Seeker till, till September. Uh, and presumably declaring his income, but but still remaining on the payment. So she sees it as another robo debt in the making. Uh, and I don't know, Centrelink really needs to be well supported and the staff really well trained and supported to be able to cope with the stuff that's going to happen over the next few months, or we yeah. will get stories like that. So thank you, thank you, Gay, for that. Now we're going to talk about. Oh, I've had two great comments from from uh, one woman who runs a, a local dance studio who is very worried about JobKeeper ending because, um, you know, that is keeping them going. Uh, and another who is almost a representative for about 12,000 hairdressers and beauty therapists in Australia through a fantastic page that she runs on Facebook. And both of them highlight in their comments that there is a real gender impact in this, uh, in the current yeah. situation. Women running businesses, the type of businesses women women are running are really feeling the pain. And, and look, we could roll out all the stats at all the other things that are impacting women. But even in small business, I'm seeing women uh, and their businesses there's a there's a pretty severe impact there and there's no it doesn't seem to be any attempt by the government to address that issue yeah. in particular uh you know i don't know how i don't know that Again, you can do I mean, a different yeah you're right susan well well i think look i think if we gave more look we know the the industries most affected are person well, there's a number of industries that are affected but certainly they include personal uh, care services um, so anywhere where that's direct, when it's a service rather than goods and it's enga close engagement, um, but it, wherever you look, if you look at frontline retail, if you look at um, health professionals, of course, there's men and women, but there's more women. So in terms of just taking up the sort of uh, the front line of things, and then on top of that, um, some of the sectors of the economy that are most affected just by the nature of the pandemic have, have also impacted disproportionately upon women workers because they're in those sectors uh, you know so there is that there is that issue and then the other problem we have is because they've now given almost unfettered access or too much access in my view to this for some people to super it's meant that people are emptying their superannuation funds and we know because when we go in now the workforce more often than men that they're they least can afford to take out money early in their working life because they'll end up not having sufficient savings at the at the end of it so on a whole range of policy areas, um, there is a there is a there is a an impost on women. I'm just talking broadly now. Of course, we know of terrible situations that happen to men as well. But if you just do the gender divide, you can see it's actually it's been a greater imposition just by those variables. It's not that it's people gone out of the way to do that. It's just the nature of the sectors affected the feminised sectors affected uh, and the nature of women in and out of the workforce not always being constantly connected um, insofar as retirement savings are concerned. So how do they fix that? Well, if you fixed, if you looked after the sectors most affected, then you're certainly going to help more women if they're, if it's a, if it's a, a sector with more women in it. Um, they, they should have more safeguards on access to super. I think you need to be able to access super in real hardship, but I'm worried about it being them emptying funds at this point and having... Uh, real struggles when we get past all of this. So they're not easy. To, they're not easy policy decisions, but they need to be reviewed, and then they need to be recalibrated. To to again, if it it, sh it should be focusing on those in most in need, businesses most affected, sectors most affected, and if we did that, I think you'd see also more support for them generally. Mm. Now we're going to talk about NBN because. Every now and again, we lose you, so <laughs> it's a slight lag, but that's better than what a lot of people in this electorate are still finding, because the NBN yeah. has not finished rolling out yet, uh, and it is terribly dependent on degraded copper. And, mm. and what we've seen in this last few months is 
the ability of businesses to operate remotely and to not have to commute from this peri-urban area into CBDs. Um, yet what's holding us back is the technology, which is a ridiculous situation to be in. That should be, the infrastructure should be there and ready to go. So um, the, the, an extra impost on businesses in large parts of the electorate is just the telecommunications. There's no mobile signal because we've got masses of black spots. Telstra yeah. will not connect landlines anymore for any new builds um, So because NBN's on its way. But for those people, it's been a year or two without any kind of, um, you know, landline communication and certainly no fibre. And and even now, I'm, I caught up with a bunch of people at the weekend in Currajong Heights who, there's, then they're not even due to get NBN until the end of the year. That's December 2020 is now the date. Having been told it should have been a couple of years ago, you know, how all the delays have worked. So this is the real frustration. I've got a community where small businesses could thrive remotely from where a lot of their customer base is and the one thing holding them back is the nbn well i agree with you susan look i live um uh 10 minutes from an international airport and i live 20 minutes you know to, to cbd melbourne and i only got the nbn four months ago um uh, and the ha and it's been very haphazard the whole way in which nbn's happened um, and and just or just connectivity, not even NBN, just a reasonable sp speed um, that would be operating. But but look, you know, it's it's a long history. Uh, we could go right back, but it really was as a country we took off. We we broadband. We were about a decade late. Yeah. <laughs> we should have been doing it during the the mining boom of, of the nineteen nineties and early two thousands. That's when we were had the most public expenditure when we had enormous revenue and we were we would have and, and and comparable countries were doing it and we should have we should have done it then and then we've been ever since trying to play catch up uh but labor certainly doesn't support um the copper uh, replacement of fiber uh, and of course we've got to present our policies to the next for the next election and they've got to be affordable but we know that connectivity for this country and and for our economy and for our businesses and for education, which is becoming more and more obvious, just dealing with the virtual learning uh, and for health reasons in regions more remote than where you are, but even anywhere outside of CBDs and big cities needs to improve. Um, it's a critical uh, quality of life issue. So it's got a, it's a priority for, for labor and we do need to do better. I, I just, for the life of me, never understood why we, we went down the copper path. I thought it was one of Malcolm Turnbull's biggest mistakes, given that he says he understood, like, you know, he, he certainly is someone who has understood the, the sector on one level, but as a minister, he chose to go down a very unusual short-term path, unfortunately. And then that's placed us in a position where, you know, what the, the hardware that we're putting in is already obsolete. <laughs> Um, and then there's questions around, you've got more challenges too in, in your area. Um, so I'd be certainly interested, and I'm sure so would Michelle Rowland, be interested to see what we could do to, to deal with some of the um, particular challenges you might have, even beyond the national challenge we have of getting a proper broadband uh, network operating uh, in this country, um, because we are woefully bad relative to comparable countries, which mm. is very disappointing given that we're a large country but we have 90 percent of our people live in sort of seven locations and then we could have dealt with the regions in some ways there's a lot of efficiencies because we have these large cities uh, and yet um, uh, we haven't really managed to succeed in a way that we should have and i think i put part of it down to being a decade late we shouldn't have been starting in the beginning you know 2008 we should have been starting in much earlier than that you know, a proper broadband system. Yeah, yeah. And, I, you know, Paul Keating's clever nation put a lot of investment into um, technology and online mm -hmm. learning. And in fact, my business won an award for the best online educational program mm -hmm. uh, that yeah. involved video and interactive stuff. But of course, mm -hmm. you couldn't operate it on ADSL or dial up. And, mm -hmm. you know, you couldn't even operate it on ADSL too terribly efficiently. You know, <laughs> 
technology has sort of caught up with something we developed in the very late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, and that's held Australia's small entrepreneurial businesses, you know, businesses back from really competing. Um, and, it, you know, Brendan, it kind of goes to the issue about what does the federal government do for small business? Now, in a pandemic like this, there's very tangible things that you can do around um, tax and, and support and all those things. But I've always thought that really the, the aim of a federal government is to make, to put the big things in place so that we can get on with what we do as small businesses. And so in the Blue Mountains, Bob Davis as the previous, um, a yeah. previous member for Macquarie and as a state member for Blue Mountains, the big infrastructure that the business needed was a, a better quality road. And, you know, getting two lanes each way to Katoomba absolutely changed the tourist dynamic there and uh, you know it meant small businesses could thrive the 21st century version of that is telecommunications and and that's what will really help small business thrive um, among I other. agree and I, and I think don't you think that I mean there's no there's no good uh, there's no good coming out of this pandemic but there are some lessons mm. and the one obvious lesson if like we're doing now is you know is this connectivity that this virtual connectivity that that is so critical um and uh i think when we return to what it will be as much as normal as we hopefully can return to um i think we're going to be th these are the lessons we won't forget and we'll be saying well we need to do a lot better in these areas either one because we can't go through that again and we need to be well connected but but just for just uh, for our economy for the country uh, we do need to do better. It's so. It's. I think it's, a, it's been a bit of a wake up call and a good reminder to to us that you know how critical communication. You know, Susan, we have to present an alternative, and we will emphasise this issue. I believe because it is absolutely vital for our economy. And mm. the fact that we can, you know, it's a global economy. Uh, we're connected to it. But if we don't have um, the infrastructure, then we'll be going backwards. Uh, and that's on every scale, on every metric, whether it's uh, business, whether it's education, health, and so on. Um, now, there's a couple of other questions I need to touch on. And I'll just, I'll go to this one on, on JobKeeper. Um, one sure. small business saying that the flat rate of JobKeeper is a real problem because it does mean that the part-timers are earning a lot more uh, than they ordinarily would. And mm -hmm. some then are earning significantly less. Um, so yeah. that's something, you know, really just a message from, from some of my businesses that they'll be looking at what the government does uh, in that. Yeah, look, I think, look, firstly, uh, if I can uh, empathise with the government to some extent, if you're going to do something very quickly and you need it out the door very quick, it's going to be quite crude. And there's no doubt that JobKeeper, JobSeeker, well, firstly, I think they, they devised JobSeeker without having regard to JobKeeper. You have to remember that. I mean, you know that. Um, and and we, know, we know they've only got a wage subsidy because we just banged on about it along with the unions till they yeah. saw those cues. And biz yeah. Yeah, the businesses, the unions, Labor, but I still believe the biggest reason was they would return to their electorates and then saw the cues yeah. and went, oh, goodness. <laughs> and when they saw the cues around Centrelink offices and they I'm didn't sure quite... that's what they said, Brendan. <laughs> well, they said something like that. Yeah. They probably wasn't so much a G-rated version of that, but um as as we were all shocked even that by the speed in which people business were going under and workers were queuing up for support as were independent contract sole traders trying to find support um so i understand but i think so because they did job seeker first i don't think they then they had to work out well we have to increase job keeper above the, this double of new start um, and of course they didn't even yeah that's right so there's no prescription around paying people up to what they were earning um, so and, and then people who were earning a lot more who had more responsibilities were not being paid uh, you know, were being paid less it, so it was crude and I understand there would have been some 
some reasons for that in terms of speed, but really uh, it should have been more reflective of people's wages. Mm -hmm. And I think we would have been able to make more, more people eligible yeah. and that include therefore more businesses eligible if we'd actually been closer to subsidies, you know, rather than giving people like winners and losers. It was too, there were the gaps between winners and losers was too great. It was never going to be a perfect fit, but it was a mile off because of the way it was designed. It should have been closer to the payments that people normally receive, whether it was higher because they had a full-time job and they've got kids, whatever, or lower because they're, they're living at home and they were doing two shifts and they were still getting $750 a week. Um, yeah. So I think that was, that was a, the, yeah. So whilst I can accept margins of error, these margins were way too big. And that was too much waste. And that waste, that expenditure, that taxpayer's money could have been spent on uh, ineligible workers, whether they are in the arts community, whether they were casuals in the hospitality, food and accommodation. It, it could have, you know, whether, whether they were people in higher education who've, been, who've missed out. They could have designed it more efficiently and more equitably, both for business and for workers. And so that's my greatest criticism, mm -hmm. that not that they spent the money, but they spent it uh, too um, crudely and it left all these people out mm -hmm. and had these, you know, unintended consequences of people getting windfalls uh, and other people uh, losing wages mm -hmm. uh, who were working in the same workplace it was, you know, it was just too crude. I mean, you, I knew it couldn't be a perfect tailored system yeah. arrangement, but it was too, too far off the mark, in my can view. But, talk, you know, it's easy to criticise, but that's what it looks like to me. Uh, can we talk about one of those groups of losers this week? Um, actually, it might have been last week. I don't even know what day. Yeah. Tuesday, so it was last week. Um, one of our food charities, Hawkesbury Helping Hands, has mm. uh, been helping uh, students for international students who are living here, who of course are uh, being given very, very little support, some from their universities, nothing from the government. Uh, and that goes to, it sort of feeds into a question that Jack is asking about, uh, do you think the coronavirus will have an impact on the way Australia deals with its temporary migrant workforce? Because some small businesses do rely on students to, to be working part-time. Uh, while they're out here and obviously other businesses um, have a reliance on on backpackers uh, as well as other mi temporary migrant workers can you what are your thoughts around what the consequence of coronavirus might be okay well i think firstly temporary migrant workers are an, an important part of our labor market um, and there's different types of uh, workers with temporary uh, or with limited work rights. Firstly, overseas students, they absolutely have to have some access to the labor market, mm -hmm. just like Australian students studying overseas have access to labor markets overseas. Mm -hmm. There's reciprocal arrangements and, uh, and therefore they've got every right to be afforded that access and they pay tax on those wages. And I think giving them no support so they can't get anything from job seeker at all, nothing, and they get no support in terms of. So if the employer is employing an overseas student on a temporary visa, they can't. The, the employer gets no support, and therefore now they're unemployed. They don't get any social welfare support at all, like none. <laughs> now I'm not saying they should be treated exactly as a permanent resident or a citizen, but they should have been given more more support. I mean, there's over over well over a million people. So we're creating an underclass. I mean, I know many returned home, that's fine. Not everyone could do that. Um, so I think that was probably, again, a bit harsh, pretty harsh to mm -hmm. exclude them from any level of support, even though they'd been obviously paying taxes. Some have been paying taxes for some years. Um, obviously, uh, uh, so that, that, that when we called for them to be provided some support, that didn't happen. Um, uh, we're going to be... Look, many, many are returning home, but we'll, we'll actually see overseas students return. I mean, we, frankly, we make money out of overseas students and, and that higher education sector is such an important part of our economy. Uh, but there's a cultural connection and there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lots of other reasons why that's really in our interest to, to, to engage with students. They pay full fee. Uh, we have these relationships. When I talk to ministers in the region or beyond, 
so often they say they've studied in an Australian university or their children have. And that does provide cultural connections that you can't measure, but they're really critical. Um, and I've, that's, I, I came across that very often, would you believe? And, and, and that's the regard they hold our education system. And they pay full fee. So we're not subsidising them, but we... You do access, they do access. So it's been really quite harsh on them for those who haven't returned and they've been trying to live. And I know they've been getting food parcels and the like, and there's so many, it's, it's a pretty uh, dangerous situation. We can't be reliant though on a very large number of overseas, not so much overseas, well, overseas temporary workers. We probably became a bit too reliant given that we've got very significant underemployment and unemployment. Yes, they need to fill skill gaps and labour shortages, but we have got... Uh, now a situation where we won't be able to rely on immigration for a period it might be some years and we're going to have major skill shortages and we have to start working we have to start skilling up our own underutilized labor market we've now got 20 percent of hours underutilized that's if you add unemployment and underemployment together that's the underutilization rate it's hit the 20 percent for the first time since the great depression uh, that's a remarkable metric stat like and it really does say that the labor market is in deep trouble frankly um, but we will have to rely upon our and this might be an upside we'll be able to I'm hoping we'll invest more in our own people for those who haven't been given sufficient opportunities to to gain skills in the areas of emerging demand you know we more investment in vocational training uh, in, you know, more access to tertiary training, where there's particularly where there are skill shortages, is really an opportunity for us, yeah. an opportunity for many Australians who have not been given or have not had a great, you know, great chance of finding their way into the labour market. Mm -hmm. So we need to turn this 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 loss of uh, of incoming skills, which will be there for at least several years. You know, it may not be shut off completely, but it's going to be very a small stream of people. We'll have to turn that into a focus and investment in our own uh, labour market, our own residents and citizens. Mm. And there's an upside, I guess, out of a, a very difficult situation if we, if we grasp it. Yeah, and the interesting thing about, I mean, you're you're very lucky to have the small business and employment portfolio because the interesting yeah. thing is that it. It touches on a whole lot of other issues and you've just touched there on, um, you know, what would be TAFE and university education. Uh, and what I'm what I'm hearing a lot is that there's um, a sense that the young people leaving school this year looking for apprentices are, are thinking it's going to be a tougher time to get one than perhaps in previous in previous times you know what small business is going to want to carry that extra risk of taking on someone new when an apprentice you put a lot of yourself into an apprentice and if you're trying to get your business going you probably don't have that extra energy or the extra work to to share around um so i mean i think we need to see a a really deliberate strategy by the government to encourage employers who are able to survive to really reach out and, and take on new apprentices and, and really incentivise them, mm. uh, as well as the young people to say, hey, here's, here's some really terrific opportunities. Um, and, and of course, you know, with the, what we're hearing is it's going to be harder to get into university next year, not easier, yeah. uh, because of the cap on numbers. You know, just as a small business, I want educated, skilled and appropriately equipped young people and education's the key to that. Absolutely. And we better be investing in, those. I mean, we have a situation where this global economic contraction and this recession we're enduring, we don't even know where how it's going to end. We don't know how, there's so many imponderables. It's very, well, I mean, you can be optimistic and say, we'll get through this pretty quickly. But even if we were to come out of this by ne next year sometime, the global economy will not. If you look, you only have to look around uh, North America, Europe, South America, parts of Asia. It, it, the devastation is, it, this is going to be a decade long recovery in many respects. And for some of, of our, some of our people, um, young people, 
it's going to be it could if we don't invest in education and vocational and tertiary education yeah um you know this is going to be really difficult and, and there's got to be some form of consideration for a jobs guarantee that look the last recession we had in 1991 keating introduced working nation we had um we had uh, very significant labor market programs, which were minimum, but they were reward wages, but they were trying to keep people connected or reconnect them. So you've got wage subsidies, that can work, that should continue. But there's so many people now falling out of the labor market, businesses not being able to employ people, businesses not surviving. There's going to be, you've got to cultivate those business people to see if they can recover. That's got to be a focus because the employers will keep those workers connected. But you then have to look after so many young people coming out of our education institutions with a little prospect of jobs, potentially, if the economy just continues to not recover, in fact, uh, deteriorate if it does. And so the thing that it's any smart country will invest in, in traineeships, apprenticeships, uh, university places to get ready for the rec global recovery, just like companies do when they can. Large companies can afford it. Small businesses have difficulty. Mm -hmm. So what you need is a partnership between government, education institutions, and small businesses. And, you know, and there are vehicles which can allow for businesses to take on traineeships and apprenticeships without taking the burden, yeah. the entire burden. There are vehicles that do that right now. Uh, and we, we need to do something. But look, small business has to be part of the, the solution because it's such a high proportion of our labour market now and our economy. It, where once, maybe 30 years ago, was smaller, it's now a third and growing. Mm -hmm. So you need to find vehicles, plat, sort of methods to, to make sure that small businesses can access uh, young, skilled people. And young people need to find work, employers. And, 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 you know, and not everyone is going to be large business that can't employ everyone, even if we want them to. And we, we don't. We want there to be that complementary um, uh, sort of um, group types of employees in the marketplace. So um, but I really do think that we've got a long way to go yet. And and if we're clever as a country, we'll be investing mm -hmm. in the most important resource we've always had, and that's our people. And I do worry about the next generation of young people, people in their 20s now, people coming up through uh, university or high school or going through vocational training. I do worry about their future if we don't invest in them because it's not looking particularly uh, rosy for them. Uh, even if Australia is, and it's true to say, we're doing relatively better than most, but it's the global economy will still impact upon us uh, even if we do everything else right. You know, and I think we hopefully will invest. Uh, and that's what I'm hoping the government will be looking to do. Yeah. And, and here's a comment from Chris Miller. Make TAFE free again to train up our youth into trades in areas where we've got a skilled workforce shortage. Yeah. So I'll take that as Absolutely. a comment. <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah. Um, I mean, TAFE has to be, TAFE has to be the centre of vocational training. And as you know, Susan, Last before the last election, we wanted to commit two of every three dollars in vocational training and may and and just rebuild TAFE because it's been impoverished yeah. uh, over many many years and it has to be renovated and, and and you know put back where it belongs in the centre of vocational training. Um, now times times running away. There's one other topic that's a couple of comments have come through, and that's around childcare. So jobs job keeper has ended for childcare workers. And, and look, I'm getting, um, I'm catching up with my childcare workers in the next day or so to really see how it's panning out. And I've kept in pretty close contact with the directors of the, the variety of local early educators that we have from long day care, family day care, uh, and community preschools. But, you know, a couple of things are happening. I remember as a small business, when my business was really very new, um, even though I wasn't necessarily making money, I needed to invest time and I needed someone to look after my kids. My young, they were babies yeah. and toddlers then. But I didn't have a lot of money. So I, I look at the fact that there's been free childcare from a parent's point of view going, well, that would have been a real lifting of the burden. Now, the model didn't work for every, uh, every early education um, facility. It worked for some, didn't work for others. You know, it has not been a perfect model. Um, so I think just from a purely thinking of small business is 
I want us to keep a really close eye on how this next transition happens, what impact it has on women, many of whom work in small business or have their own small business, uh, and, and what that then does for that crucial early education, because that's the other stuff we know now that, you know, my kids yeah. are 30. We didn't know 30 years ago how important it was for their brain. We knew it was good for us. We figured it was okay for them. <laughs> uh, but the more we know, the more we see it's that true. early education is just vital for these kids to become uh, the fabulous learners of, of the next generation. Yeah. Um, so I, I think we also have to keep a small business eye, but remembering also that many of these early education organisations are small businesses run by exactly. women. They so are. it's a really complex problem and I don't think we're going to get a simple answer to it, but I'll certainly be feeding back to you and a couple of people have just raised the issue around, oh. um, you know, the, the impact of, on childcare has been an issue and will continue mm. to be. Um, yeah, that's a terrible. Yeah. I mean, I look. Firstly, the sector has been treated abysmally. Firstly, and, they, and they were negged upon. Heard about it all through the. They see it on TV. They don't get told yeah, beforehand. No. So I mean, the, the idea that so job keeper they were told applied to them, and then it was going to be then then they changed their position and and stopped it uh, midstream. Yeah. which was pretty unfair. And I just other sectors of the economy. Um, I don't think this government would have treated some other sectors of the economy the way it just thought it could treat childcare sector quite abysmally. Um, mm -hmm. The support for parents by the fees has been great, but now people have had a taste of that. They're wondering, well, how do I go back? Particularly my job is not secure. And mm -hmm. also I'm fearful of my employment and how do I keep my kids? So look on every level, and you're right, it ticks every box. Investing in childcare, preschool, if you look around the world, economies that don't even have a lot of natural resources, the European states that have got AAA economies, 2A country, they all have um, high investment in preschool education and care. Um, you know, Germany, uh, the Scandinavian, Norway, Finland, these are all AAA economies. There's only 11 or nine, I think, now in the world. And some of them have natural resources. Some do not have any really sort of other natural advantages, but they do have a first-class education system and they're still going up the ladder as we go down. And we have got to arrest the decline of our, our and our sort of relegation down the ladder on education. And we can't do that if we don't have proper preschool investment, uh, which will give our kids the best opportunity to compete with the brightest and best countries who look after their citizens relatively better. On top of that, women are likely to participate in the labour market if they're assured that there is proper support for, for the kids in preschool. And we know when you increase the participation rate of women in the labour market, it's axiomatic. The economy uh, is much, much better off when that happens. And the countries with the higher participation rates are the countries with greater productivity and greater growth. Just <laughs> so on every level, yeah. there's it's crazy not to do it yeah and and look that really got uh, we'll have to wrap up but it really takes us sure. to the last, very last sort of wrap up point from uh chris who who says we're just not seeing a plan beyond the medium term and that's I completely agree with that. We have an opportunity, as horrible as all this is, and will continue to be, quite frankly, uh, if we can't find, use it as a pathway to things that we probably should have done, as you say, back in the 90s, it's, a, it's an even more of a, of a disaster for us in the future. And, a, there, and any disaster for the economy is a disaster for small business. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I know you'll be pushing for there to be some longer-term thinking uh, and and I guess if we don't get it from the government, as always, we'll be the ones to drive that conversation. Look, I think there's two things. Firstly, thanks again, Susan, for the invitation. And any questions that people may have of me after after this point, um, I'm happy to you know, have Susan. If you would ask, you know, ask me uh, then uh, later, and I can always you can always get back to to those who are asking those questions. But I just want to say, look, we need to do two things, I think. Um, right now, people are quite anxious uh, and, and the, the times feel very uncertain and we don't know how this is going to end. 
and our focus has to be on the health and our immediate focus has to be on the health of the nation and the and the health of the economy and so we have to do sort of the two things we do have to lift our eyes to the horizon but more than probably uh, more than in recent times we really have to start coming up to solu- coming up with solutions that deals with the anxiety that is th- that is through seen through the prism of the covid pandemic that that's important too people right now want us to have a vision but they also want us to un- explain how we will deal with the immediate challenges that they confront whether it's in health whether it's in uh, whether it's in the uh, getting a job whether it's maintaining the business so i think we do need to do both of those things we can't seem to be looking too far ahead and that's all we need to be dealing with the immediate and we also have to have a vision for the future and if we can fashion that then i guess we'll be in a position to be competitive at the next election let's hope Yeah, let's hope. But thank you, Brendan, for giving up an evening. Uh, And you and I will keep talking about the needs of Blue Mountains and Hawkesbury businesses as we move forward. Thanks, everyone, for your comments. Anything we didn't get to, I'm sorry, but we will follow up and, and chase up answers or give you some feedback on your comments. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.